welcome to uh, the podcast uh, with um, Ultimate Athlete Concepts and, and Neutromic Sports Nutrition. I'm Joseph Johnson, uh, owner and president of, 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 of both companies. And uh, so I encourage you to check out Neutromics.com with our new venture there. And I'm, I'm joined uh, today uh, with our author at UA Concepts and also formulator with Neutromic Sports Nutrition, Rick Bruner, uh, who's been responsible for uh, formulating uh, our newest product, Myosync, and, and in the course of um, developing a new product, which we're going to talk about as well. So thanks a lot for joining me, Rick. Uh, I'm excited to talk about the stuff that you've been looking at lately and how we're going to I improve upon what we've been doing. Well, thank you, Joseph. It's good to be with you. So we did the book about a year and a half ago, and we've gotten a lot of really good responses. A lot of people have, have welcomed that, that information because it was kind of it was new in one sense uh, and different, I think, is probably the, the, the bigger thing. You and I have talked about this a lot, that uh, a lot of uh, sports nutrition kind of evolved from the bodybuilding world, and it's kind of carried over into the sports world. But a lot of the qualities that we're trying to develop in the sports world, which is speed of action, speed of mo movement, right, depending on what it is, quickness, explosiveness, uh, maximal speed, whatever you want to call it, these are the characteristics that we're after, and they weren't really being fulfilled by the bodybuilding world. Could you talk about kind of how that evolved and then what brought you to thinking along the lines that you're thinking now? Sure. Um, you know, I... I uh... I grew up in the sport nutrition industry back uh, in the in the 1980s, so I, I saw a lot of the evolution of the the, uh, the uh, field and uh, really evolved out of uh, the medical community initially. Uh, you know, research from medicine and then extrapolating that, kind of putting it into the, the athletic market. But it really started mostly with bodybuilding nutrition. You know, building building big muscles. Um, and it really wasn't quite a, the best fit for athletes because athletes are like you said, our speed strength, uh, they're looking at speed components, they may be looking at endurance uh, speed components, things like that. Um, a lot of team sports have you know, multiple compounding uh, traits. So uh, it's, uh, it, I thought it was gonna be very important to uh, research and investigate um, nutrients that would turn on certain gene pathways that would address those speed strength traits, for instance rather than just, just pure muscle, uh, muscle traits. So that's kind of how we started, was we started looking at uh, different nutrients. And of course, I, when I traveled to Russia many times over several years, um, working with Russian scientists and coaches and athletes, um, I came to find that there was still a lot of nutritional things missing. I mean, we were doing, you know, Russians even were doing vitamins and minerals and things for the liver and adaptogens and whatnot but not so much things that would increase neuromuscular uh, power, reaction time, quickness, those, those real fine motor skills that are so very important with athletes is really what we focused on um, and initially. So that's, and that's really where Myosync came from, is came from those ideas of what can we do nutritionally to help the, uh, the nervous system and the muscle system um, optimize themselves during training uh, to yield a better result in those traits like like reaction time and quickness and, and explosive power. Okay, so that's, that's kind of where we started. So, you know, and th this is kind of, you know, w what was so intriguing to me was because, you know, you're looking at when you're developing an athlete, you realize the difference is not his muscles, it's his nervous system is what's different. The, 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 the regulator of the muscles, if you will. The nervous system is the issue. So, you know, if you've got a guy who's looking at a 100-mile-an-hour fastball and he's got to be able to react to it, you know, how do you train that? You know, there's, you know, vision training and other stuff, but you can actually look at it from a nutritional standpoint. Um, what makes a guy, you know, just super quick, uh, you know, on the basketball court, his first step is just way faster than everybody else's, or, uh, you know, a guy that can jump, jump high. These are, they're not necessarily even, not only are they not muscular, they're not even necessarily representations of strength it's how fast the muscles contract not how much force they can apply but how fast they can apply it. and i think that's the distinction a lot of people don't realize that that it's not about how strong you are it's how fast you can apply the strength that you have that is you know the definition of power if you will and that's what we were after so can you can you talk about how does the nervous system actually work in that way what 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 distinguishes 
you know, being stronger from being more powerful, being more explosive? What's what's the difference? Because you know, you got guys who can squat a thousand pounds, maybe, but they're slower than syrup. What's the difference? And then, how did you kind of, how were you able to zero in on the the uh, the nutrition nutritional component of that? Sure, it, uh, it you know, it, and it all starts uh, with the ocular nerves in the eye. Uh, and goes down through the spinal column and then out to the muscles. And so it's a very complex process, but it's all utilizing um, uh, in some kind of a neuro, neural response. Uh, so really, we target the nervous system first. Okay, the nerves then just happen to uh, activate certain muscle fibers uh, that you, you, you want to, uh, to do what you want them, want them to do. So um, the, the nervous, the, the nerve fibers, and again, these are just fibers. Uh, they're they're, um, they're activated by certain certain nutrients, um, you know, acetylcholine, especially in the synapse of the nerve fibers, where the nerve fibers touch each other. Uh, well, actually, they don't touch each other. It's almost like a spark plug in between them, where the uh, uh, the uh, acetylcholine is. And if the acetylcholine is not in the synapse, there is no muscle firing. Okay, so that's the first thing. And, um, of course, you can train this, too. I mean, I, you, that's what training does. You adapt. You create a stress uh, in training, and then you respond to that stress through adaptation. Uh, and you can train these fibers to hold those that acetylcholine in the synapse longer and more efficiently, okay, and quickly replenish itself so that it can fire again and again and again with efficiency. And that's really what we're after, even nutritionally, with um, with uh, myosync is to supply different nutrients in that uh, in in those synapses to where they activate more quickly. Now, when you combine that with training, again, the training has to be very explosive. If you think about it, we're just sitting there doing really slow bodybuilding, you know, curls. Uh, myosync is not necessary for that because we're not we're not um, we're not stressing the system enough to warrant the nutrients uh, ac activity. But if we are doing things like shock methods of training, like box jumps or you know, plyometric drills or, or over speed drills or maximum lifts or with, with speed or something like that, then myosync is going to really perform because it's going to replenish those, the uh, acetylcholine in the synapse very efficiently. And again, all the way from the ocular to the brain to the, to the central nervous system to the peripheral. Uh, it's going to work on all of those levels because it's systemic. It works. It doesn't go to one target muscle, for instance, and do that. But when you're working a specific muscle group or groups, actually, you're probably going to be using compound exercises, but you're going to be utilizing that myosin, those nutrients in, in, uh, in the synapse uh, to uh, replenish and efficiently uh, use the uh, acetylcholine. So... The acetylcholine being the rate, one of the rate limiting factors, and then it's not that simple, too. I, and I want to kind of let people kind of understand uh, the complexity and how you kind of put this together. So, you know, raising the acetylcholine levels is key, but you got to keep it there because a lot of times, like from what you said, it can be very transient with, uh, with certain products that have been out there. It'll be transient bringing it up and it'll, they'll, they'll come down. You got to hold it there for a while. And then also, um, one of the things that's interesting about myosync is not only does the acetylcholine levels rise, but the actual receptor sites for acetylcholine are mm -hmm. rising too, which is interesting because otherwise you would look at a saturation point like you might with creatine. You know, once you've fill the creatine stores, there's no more additional value and there's no additional adaptive response from the body. But what how it appears with myosync is that we might be developing more acetylcholine receptor sites so that you're not seeing that same, uh, you know, saturation point in the same way that you would with creatine. Could you talk about that? Yeah, we don't we don't quite know if uh, how much uh, of an increase in receptor sites we're uh, engaging, but we believe it's possible because what we're seeing with even myosync is even when you're on it for a while um, you know you're creating this adaptive response ultimately the training results in some kind of an adapt adaptation to that training so that you can you can go further and further and further and further in your in your, res your response and your performance so so what myosync is doing is it's basically fine-tuning between the nervous system and the muscles 
uh, muscle fibers. Um, this basically it's it's tuning it up uh, and making it very very efficient. So that when you do this explosive type of training, the, the, the muscles really are loving it. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're really engaged uh, very quickly and they're replenishing very quickly. You know, not only, not only uh, say, speed strength, but speed strength endurance wise. And then there's a carryover effect, which um, we've seen, which is exciting because, um, you know, just that one moment of taking the supplement and then doing the workout, for instance, is great. But ultimately, you have to. You, your goal really is to adapt to a higher level, and what we're finding is that we're the athletes are adapting to a higher level when they're training correctly. And again, training is paramount. This supplement is nothing without the training. Okay, it's, it 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 it, uh, it makes it more efficient and gives a a, a better result. Um, but it's but it's got to be used together. But then the training. What we find too is even when the athletes aren't using the mile sink in a, in a, in a future training cycle um, or a workout, they're they're still uh, improved. And the reason for that is their neuromuscular pro system is more finely tuned, and so it can do these things. So, like what you were saying at the beginning is, what's the difference between an elite athlete that that can you know go up and do an amazing uh, catch in an end zone with a football and just like how did they get that? Whereas you know, you look at a lesser athlete that they, they, there's no way they could have ever uh, uh, reacted to that. Okay. And, 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 and all the way from perception from the eyes to, uh, to the brain, to the nervous system, to the hands, the fingers, all of those things have to work properly. And an elite athlete is very finely tuned or more finely tuned than a novice athlete. And the reason for that is everything is, is synchronized. The muscle neuromuscular process is very efficiently synchronized. And that's really what we're after with MileSync. We're after introducing that in the right training, um, you know, a, a high level training uh, to elicit this adaptive response to the neuromuscular process. So I, I think this is one key point that you made, and I, I'd like to just make it one more time. The training is the key. So if you don't know what you're doing training wise, taking a supplement is just like spitting in the wind. Uh, they need to be used. Uh, intelligently in in the context of excellent training so you know you're going to need the explosive training and the uh, you know the plyometrics and the jump training all the different tools that we have in our toolbox and what myosync does is kind of like the it's like the cherry on the sundae now it's going to take what you got and amp it up so instead of you know getting whatever your response is it's going to be better and what we've seen in many cases you know uh, and just in my practical experience, we've seen some significant improvements. And one of them, which is interesting, and this will kind of be a lead into what I'd, I'd like to have you uh, talk about next, is um, we would have athletes take a dose uh, and then we check the vertical jump an hour later. And in a lot of cases, the vertical jump had went up already in an hour by about an inch, give or take. You didn't see it across the board in every athlete, but you saw it in a good number of them, which is a really good sign, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so it's a great pre-workout supplement and I know you're really not big on hardly any pre-workout supplements and this is kind of like one of the first ones that actually fits the bill for what you need you know it's not a post-workout supplement it's a it's a pre-workout supplement it's it's there to help make that workout better can you talk about you know because I know you and I've had many conversations about this there's a lot of stuff that's out there on the market that you are definitely not crazy about and it and, and the market's saturated with pre-workout stuff it almost has I would dare say it might be have become the biggest part of the market. I don't know if it is or not, but it's become big, definitely. What what are the problems with that, and why is myosin? You know, wh why is myosin make a lot of sense, and the other ones not as much? Sure. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm not a big fan of pre-workout supplements. Really, myosin is the only thing that I would ever recommend to a, an athlete um, uh, to elicit a training response because. That's ultimately what we're after is an adaptive response to the training. And I call a lot of these pre-workout supplements, um, supplements filled with goodies. Okay. Yeah. You know, they, they've got things in there that make uh, things easy, um, uh, easier in the workout, you know, make your workout easier. Well, that's counter intuitive because the workout should be kick butt hard. I mean, it should be, but it should be very efficient. So it should be very taxing to the neuromuscular system. And when you add in a lot of these goodies that are in a lot of these formulas out there, 
you actually reduce the adaptive response. Uh, case in point are vitamins, uh, vitamins like uh, vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin E uh, in, in, in dietary supplements. Um, the athletes that I've worked with over many, many years and counseled uh, and the coaches I've worked with, I've oftentimes recommended that they do not take additional antioxidant-based supplements like C, like vitamin E, but you see them added to these products in an almost mindless way because for two reasons. One is the people that are designing formulas don't know what they're doing. Or number two, athletes think that they need these antioxidants to, produ to reduce training stress or you know, help them recover or whatever. But what's not recognized is that these, um, these uh, antioxidants are actually retarding the adaptive response. And here's how they do that. Um, now science knows that adaptation is through specific stress signals. That's what you're doing in a workout. You're stressing the body somehow. Well, what are you, how, what are you stressing? Well, you're creating free radicals. You're creating heat shock proteins. You're, in, you're creating inflammatory cytokines. And for the average person, that may not be so good. But for an athlete, those are the signaling molecules that tell the body, hey, something bad just happened. Man, this guy or gal worked me to the bone, and I don't like it. We got to get bigger, stronger, faster, quicker, more reactive, whatever it is. Okay, so those signaling molecules tell the body to adapt. But when you start taking in goodies in, in a pre-workout supplement, you basically blunt that response. You knock down the cytokines, you knock down the heat shock proteins, and you knock down the, uh, the reactive oxygen, ROS, or, or free radicals. And those are the signaling molecules that cause adaptation. So this, it's, this, the publications on this are extreme now. They, they, uh, there's dozens and dozens of scientific studies that have been done on these different nutrients and how they blunt the stress response. And many of these studies now are being done on athletes, including very elite athletes, and they're seeing the same thing, that they blunt the stress response. So myosync is different in that it amplifies, not necessarily amplifies the stress response, but it, it allows the, the, your, your maximal stress response to be optimized. It doesn't take away from it. It doesn't interfere with these uh, signaling molecules that, that contribute to adaptation. It simply amplifies it. And, and, yeah, and so it, basically what, what, what the myosync's doing, it's working in conjunction with the training. You know, if you're doing explosive work, this is right there, just amping up the effect of it. Or the other ones, like you said, are blunting. And I think this is an important point uh, for people that uh, there's a, a big focus sometimes on recovery uh, as well, just in a general sense. And, and, and not that it doesn't have its place, but like Dr. Barashansky used to, he, he, he would say, you know, you trying to over, -re if you will, over recover, he said, it's really not effective. He said, you need the body to adapt to what you did. Let it do its work and tr not try to speed it up all the time or not always try to circumvent it. Let it do what it does. So then the body, because the body has its own wisdom, if you will, uh, right. about how to adapt. And you trying to circumvent the process is not necessarily a good thing. It can be bad. Right. Even and, before, before or after, especially before, it's just uh, really taking away, uh, uh, it's muddying up the stress signals and not allowing the body to, in, in post-workout, adapt to those stress signals. Yeah. So I think that the key takeaway for everybody is, you know, look, most of the ones that you look at don't have an additional value. A lot of them, uh, you know, maybe geared towards increasing nitric oxide or you know bringing other vitamins and minerals into the play into the into play at that particular time is not a good thing more sugar is not a good thing um you yeah know. you want to make uh, you know it's interesting you know even water you think about everything even water uh i mean i'm old school i i didn't there, you know, I, I, I practiced for several hours a day in 100 and 100 plus temperature in, in football and full pads and a helmet with no water breaks yeah and you might think you couldn't do that today and rightfully so. I mean, you have to be prudent about it. But um, there, there, there is something to say for that in that you're making the body work yeah. and you're not giving it so many goodies to, to uh, interfere with its stress. Because that's ultimately what we're after is a functional stress, an optimal stress in training. And when you start loading in stuff in there in excess, uh, I agree with Dr. Verkoshansky that it's a, 
it, uh, it, it will blunt that adaptive response to that stressor. Yeah, I think it's important for everybody to kind of take take away uh, from from this discussion. Now, so mouse ink has been pretty well received. We've had uh, Olympic level swimmers, uh, NHL players, NFL players, uh, guys at other high levels in college uh, and different university teams have been using it and having a very good effect. Um, so it's been well received. Now, since we introduced that, you and I have been talking, you've kind of been looking at at uh, some ways of even improving that formula. And we haven't released anything yet, but I'd like to hear, you, you know, what you've been looking at lately, science-wise. I know you've been looking at a lot of uh, different um, forms of fish oil that could be beneficial uh, or DHA uh, products. Could you just kind of give me, give me, fill me in on, on what you've been looking at and how that might help amplify the effects of myosin? Yeah, sure. The, so the fish oil is an interesting thing. You know, uh, athletes probably, uh, most of them probably don't take fish oil. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, I, I, I'm amazed when, when athletes aren't. But um, the fact is that fish oil, which has omega-3 fatty acids in it, primarily uh, EPA and DHA, uh, the two main uh, omega-3s in fish oil, um, uh, those omega-3 fatty acids are an integral part of the nervous system and of the muscles, muscle fibers themselves, and of basically all cells, including the red blood cells that deliver oxygen to tissue. And when the body doesn't have enough omega threes in the in the cells, it's almost like uh, it becomes they become sluggish, because these are very flex. Uh, would be would, we would be, we would call flexible or deformable uh, fatty acids that um, allow things to be much more flexible. And so, for instance, with red blood cells, um, red blood cells that are higher in, say, omega-6 um, and low in omega-3, they don't flow very well through the, uh, the peripheral. And so uh, you don't get oxygenated tissue as efficiently as you would if they were, they were packed with a little bit of uh, uh, omega-3. Now, um, with myosync, um, you know, it's not an end-all. It's, it's a very useful uh, formula, very useful product, but it, it, uh, it can be even amplified with things like omega-3 fatty acids, especially DHA, because DHA is very high in the ocular tissue and in the brain and in the nervous system. So I, I, uh, I've usually recommended a little bit higher amounts of DHA in formulas. And then we're looking at some other nutrients right now as well that will help with the uh, am amplify these effects. Uh, kind of in a in a in a, in a soft gel uh, format. So um, you know, this is just another another uh, direction that we're investigating. Um, uh, but it, uh, there's a lot of good science as far as reaction and quickness and neuromuscular response, even with fish oil in the mix. And it just makes sense because if you the Western diet is very high in omega six, um, so it's very very unbalanced. It's, it's a matter of balance uh, and. Uh, if we can uh, increase the balance, improve the balance by upping the omega threes, EPA and the DHA, um, then we can make these tissues much more pliable, much more reactive than if they were were, were not high in uh, higher in omega threes. So, for for uh, you know people that are following us and read your book, stay tuned to that because that might be something that we're going to bring into the mix here at some point in this uh, in the near future. Uh, to uh, to amplify the effects of myosin, and so kind of stay tuned on that, and we'll we'll send out uh, you know obviously information once once we're uh, beginning that that aspect uh, of yeah. our development. Right. Now so that that doesn't have to be uh, like taken right with myosin; it could be taken in any time of the day because the the omega threes just basically get into cell structures over time, uh, over a few days to a couple weeks, and. Uh, and basically, you reprogram those cells to be more reactive with the with the uh, omega threes. Right. So this the, the 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 cool part is is that number one, you probably need them anyway, just from, from a general health mm -hmm. point of view. Anti-inflammatory, uh, you mm -hmm. know, it's a big big uh, a big uh, kind of benefit there. And then also, but it it plays into this, and this is something that may have otherwise not have been thought about. You know, how does that play into the nervous system, and how would it you know affect you know, myosync and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of a unique perspective. You don't, you haven't, I haven't seen it much. You know, it's kind of more on that really, if you want to call it the high end science level where it hasn't gotten down to the public yet, you know, right. uh, that right. kind of thing. Um, now, you know, obviously myosync's not the only product 
that we're going to do. We, we've got plans to do another one this year, and you and I have been talking about it. And uh, I'm excited, and I and, and I'm excited for more than one reason because what what we're looking at is something once again that's very unique. You don't see it out there much, and uh, it it's um, uh, given us a lot of the the benefits that that we that we need. Um, with uh, nutrients that maybe everybody would not have thought of. You know, this is kind of research. I know a lot of it, uh, some of it came from the Soviet Union back when you were researching with them, some of the stuff that you looked at at that particular time. So uh, the, the, uh, the new product, uh, once it's ready, will be called Torque One. It's based upon amplifying the mTOR pathway, which has gotten a lot of attention now. Like in the last year, I would say, I hadn't heard about it, you know, much, you know, beyond maybe two, three years ago. And now you're starting to see people talk about it. And partly, I think, partly because of your book, you're starting to see, I, I'm seeing conversations on this, right? And online with different people who are talking about it. And they're start, and the mTOR pathway is not starting to gain more, um, more attention. So if you would, tell me how the mTOR pathway works, because it, it's still a little bit over my head. So I'd like to hear your explanation again, how the mTOR pathway works. Why is it important? And then what can you do nutritionally to, to uh, amplify it? Okay, so sure. Um, so the mTOR pathway, so TOR stands for target of rapamycin. It's a crazy sounding name, okay, um, but it is what it is. Rapamycin was this uh, uh, fungus, uh, basically, that they found on, uh, on the island of Rapa New Guinea. Uh, so Rapa uh, is in there. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fungus that, it, that, that actually turns this pathway off. They, that's how they discovered it. The pathway is, is the master anabolic driver pathway of the body. No muscle growth, no strength growth, no no nothing growth in that regard without uh, TOR. And uh, so I shortened it to TOR. M mTOR originally st stood for um, mammalian target of rapamycin and then they changed it to mechanism of target of rapamycin. I just shortened it to TOR. So the TOR pathway itself is a series of um, basically enzyme reactions uh, and gene, gene switching uh, that uh, that turns on this this entire pathway, um, and then that leads to um, basically anabolic results. For an athlete that's training hard, the anabolic results are increases in strength, increases in muscle mass, and, and things like that. Okay, muscle power, things like that. Again, directed and driven by the training. Um, for um, but oh, some of my research, which is now done with um, older individuals, 40 and over, uh, for health, uh, the TOR pathway is actually a negative. Uh, we don't want to turn it on. We want to dial it down because it's a growth pathway. But as you get older, you grow things that you don't want to grow. Things like growth around your belly, right. uh, growth in your arteries, growth uh, cancer cell growth, things like that. The TOR, tor pathway is actually uh, never switched off. Um, and what we want to do is dial it down with older people. But for younger people, like athletes, it's very, very important. In fact, it's critical to have TOR uh, optimized. And so you you will see new products out. Uh, the, some of them are coming out. It was amazing to me. I was researching this a, a number of years ago now. And then all of a sudden, I started seeing it uh, in, uh, in sport nutrition, in, in, in sport nutrition research uh, a little bit, a little bit. Um, and uh, it's still probably not at the level that it deserves, um, but it's pretty good. Now, when I was in the Soviet Union, even way back in oh, the late 1980s, um, they were using specific nutrients uh, in their training uh, regimens that, um, that uh, were uh, restorative, anabolic, uh, promoting, and whatnot. Um, and I don't think even at that point that they really knew the mechanisms. But now we're finding out through research that these, uh, these nutrients uh, are, um, turn on the, the TOR pathway uh, for, for uh, improving its strength and muscle size and whatnot. So, so what we've done is we've investigated those different nutrients, and I've come up with, oh, um, four or five different ones. Um, there's an herb that I'm looking at right now too, that possibly would go into that, but maybe not. Um, and, uh, but they all are, all these nutrients. And the reason we called the company Neutromic is it really is kind of short for nutrigenomic. All of life is turning genes on and turning them off. So what we want to do is we want to turn the gene pathway tore on more efficiently. Okay. And so 
we're going to design, we're going to put nutrients into the body that will do that. Now, this will be a post-workout supplement. It's not something you take before the workout. You're not, you don't want to interfere or do anything to the, the training itself. But in post-workout recovery, you could you can add it. It's a con- it would be a concentrate, and you could add some of that to your whey protein, for instance. I, I like whey protein because whey has a, a decent amount of leucine and, uh, and other branch chain aminos in it that um, that also can activate the TOR pathway. Calories also activate the TOR pathways, which is why people need energy. You know, you don't want to starve yourself either. Um, so there's a number of things that can turn it on. But this this uh, TORP one supplement will be designed as a fortifier to further amplify the the TOR result in, in recovery. So basically, we're looking after the workout a little bit now uh, with this. And one of the things that you said to me many times, and I think it's it's it bears repeating that for 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 the listener is that, you know, a lot of people focus a lot on testosterone and the levels of testosterone and, you know, how much do you have and should you have more? And this is where the, 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 the issue of steroids comes up uh, with people, you know, well, if you got tons of testosterone, then obviously you're going to be better, but there's more to the story than that. And what you, like what you've, we've talked about before, there's a difference between, um, uh, transcription and translation of testosterone. There's a multiple step process and bottleneck. Uh, you know, just having a ton of testosterone does not necessarily mean that you're going to have wonderful uh, results or changes. Uh, there's, there's, there's other parts in that process and it's a bottleneck. If they're not there, you know, you're not going to get that, that, that benefit. So we're not talking about necessarily steroids here. It's more of the what you've contended is that young athletes have plenty of testosterone. That's not the problem. It's bottlenecked by other processes. Could you talk about that kind of, you know, what is the rate limiting factor? And then how do you kind of, I don't want to say circumvent, but how do you improve that? Yeah, sure. So, um, so athletes are already making plenty of homegrown testosterone. Okay. They, they have enough. And when we said a rate limiting, when you mentioned a rate limiting factor, everything in the process to build, strength or power or whatever has some bottleneck, some rate limiting factor in, in those steps to get where you want to go. And what you need to do is find out where those are. Now, testosterone works at the beginning of the building process, uh, and it's called transcription. Basically, it's basically giving a blueprint to the RNA in the cells from the genes, from the DNA, giving a blueprint and says, here's, here's an enzyme I want you to make or here's a muscle protein, a skeletal muscle protein I want you to make, or whatever, go make it. And then those RNA then go and they pick up the amino acids per the blueprint, and then they assemble those, and that's what makes these these new enzymes or skeletal muscle proteins or whatever, okay? So the RNA is a very, very important part of this. Well, in the Soviet Union, back even in the, uh, in the, uh, in the 80s, they were researching a lot of this, uh, the RNA uh, activity, not the not the testosterone directed DNA activity, but the RNA activity, with the belief that um, a lot of the issues of growth are not testosterone uh, driven; they're they're RNA driven, and so that the the bottleneck or the weak links um, were actually in the RNA. So that's what I started working with, even way back in the 90s, was to look at different nutrients that would enhance. RNA activity to assemble and put these these uh, enzymes. Again, we always think of muscle, or muscle, 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 but we have red blood cells that are proteins. We have enzymes that work on thousands and thousands of reactions of the body that are also protein structures. We have uh, uh, signaling molecules that are protein structures. So um, protein is is not just in not just muscle directed. It's 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 very broad. And so we want to optimize that. So there are different nutrients that can basically amplify the, uh, the uh, uh, RNA pathway, if you will, uh, as well. So and we're, we're working on some of that right now. So I've done it for years, but we're, we're fine-tuning it now to make it even better. Yeah, I mean, it's exciting because, like, you know, some of the stuff uh, has been known for many, many years, decades maybe, and had not made its way into the U.S., either into the literature or into – you know, the, the, the end process of making, you know, ergogenics or supplements for people, uh, which I thought was fascinating. And we were talking about stuff that, you, uh, you know, may have been talked about in the Soviet Union 30, 40 years ago and had been used, still not making its way here. And, yeah, and, you know, yeah and, and 
the important thing to realize too is that the world has changed in the last 30 years. Um, you know, when I first was going to the Soviet Union, if I wanted to communicate with a Soviet scientist or coach, uh, yeah, you could write a letter and it might get there. Well, most of the time you just had to go and, uh, you know, and sit down and, and, and stay there for a few weeks. And so um, today, though, with the Internet, uh, the science of nutrition has literally exploded across the board to health nutrition, to athletic nutrition and whatnot. The reason for that is that scientists are now able to collaborate at a, you know, a click of a mouse with a scientist in another country. I mean, they can Skype. They can do what we're doing right now. You know, they can Skype. Uh, they can send emails, they can send documents, uh, research results, whatever. And so you're seeing a lot more collaboration internationally. Um, you, you might see on a paper somebody from the U.S., somebody from, uh, from Japan, somebody from Russia. I and mean, you're going to see a lot more, more of these combining of, of, of thinkings. And so, yeah, we knew back in the 80s and even the 90s that things were working and performing. And we knew parts of the puzzle. But now those are really being dialed down. Uh, and the science is, um, I use the, uh, the, the uh, statistic that um, since the 1950s, over half of the published science on, say, just about anything, let's just pick athletic nutrition, over half of the published science has been in just the last 10 years or less. Yeah. And so it's exploded. And that's good for scientists and it's good for athletes as long as we can pull it out of the science, out of the lab. Okay, so scientists, they're geeks, okay? Um, I'm kind of a hybrid geek, okay? I'm in the between them. And uh, uh, because I've been a coach and I've been an athlete, an elite athlete, and, and I know what's necessary for, uh, at the athletic level, you have to pull it out of the lab and make it practical. And that's the key. That's the ultimate sign of success is not just to take this idea and create some marketing spin out of it, which so many products today really are marketing driven. They're market driven, almost like urban legend or something rather than results driven. Yeah. And sometimes, and even in early on, I was told by many people, well, you have to give them something to make them feel it right away, like caffeine in there or niacin, give them a flush, or you had to make it flavored, like a chocolate flavored drink or something, so that they actually felt like it was working. They didn't even know it worked. Okay. And that's the wrong way to think about all this nutritional thing. We want it to work. Okay, so we want to add things that are scientifically uh, substantiated, um, and we want to work and then investigate them in athletics. And that's why we study things like myosync um, in real world time and in real athletes. I mean, early on, we studied it on uh, soccer, elite soccer players, elite, uh, college baseball players, NFL football players, whatnot, to kind of get an idea of how it would perform. When we found out, yeah, it worked pretty, pretty good, and we made some modifications in it. Um, you know, and, and improved it even further. And, and that's still ongoing and it never never will end. We're, we've got to continuously uh, update and and try things. And again, athletics is very complex. The supplement is is not the driver of performance. The, the, the workout, the training is the driver of performance. Uh, the supplement is fine tuning that and allowing the athlete to do incredibly better things. But it's a tool that allows the athlete to do that. It's not, um, you know, it, it just drives me crazy when I go to the gym and I see these athletes drinking down all these flavored beverages while they're working out. Like you need that. Like that's actually probably counterproductive because ultimately you want to be, when you're done with the workout, you want to be spent. You want to be almost dead. Okay. That's if you're going to take it to that level. When you start taking these goodies, you blunt that. So constantly fine tuning these things to see how they work with athletes what athletes they work with, young, middle, middle level, college, say, and professional, they're all different, okay? As you get to be a pro, you're a pro for a reason, okay? You are fought more finely tuned, okay? And so ultimately, we want to even fine tune them even more. Uh, so it's just a matter of experimenting with these just these things. But you've got to do it in real time, not in a lab. In the old days, they used to just study stuff with grad students or, you know, people in the class who wants to be part of a study. And you just get, you know, you get totally untrained people and it's really not real, it's not real world. So we want to take that out of there and, and test it on real, real world athletes. So I think that, that, you know, what everybody should kind of take away from that. Number one, that, uh, that there's an, you know, there's an anabolic, if you will, an anabolic window after, after a workout that, that you, like you said, it opens up around an hour, 
or so after the workout, and then it can, stays kind of open. You can kind of feed that a couple of times uh, with whey protein. And one of the things that you can do also to amplify that that is by using uh, something that um, uh, kind of ramps up the, the TOR pathway, if you will. And I'm, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm using wrong terminology here, but you know, sure. you're just kind of trying to amplify that TOR pathway. And so there's natural uh, uh, stuff that can be taken uh, uh, that can amplify that and, and increase that anabolic window's effectiveness, if you will. And so I, I think that, uh, you know, because a lot of talk has been talk. you know, you, you hear a lot of people talking about the post-workout window. It's kind of gotten more attention, you know, uh, that there's there's this window of opportunity with you, whether it be a, con like you've seen Gatorade, they've done a protein carbohydrate mixture and a couple of, a couple other companies have done the same thing. Um, and you recommend, I, I want to kind of squeeze this in here because I, you, you recommend uh, just a, a simple, you, you recommend just a simple, if you want to call it a concoction of maybe chocolate milk, some whey protein, and then now maybe, you know, torque one might be the other uh, ingredient that you would include into that mixture to really get the full effect of the anabolic window. Is that, is that correct? Sure. Yeah. So um, athletes are already, a lot of them are already doing some kind of a whey protein or a protein powder. Some of them are doing veggie proteins. Um, and some of those have some additional branch chain amino acids added to them, which, which kind of tops them off a little bit, which makes them a little bit more anabolically efficient than, a, than a, just a base veggie. Um, but uh, whey protein itself has a, a, a lot of very good uh, branch chain amino acids and especially leucine, which feeds into the TOR pathway. So that's, that's very, very important to do in, in post-workout. And a lot of athletes don't know this, but that um, there's a concept um, called muscle full, which means that um, a certain amount of whey protein, for instance, and this was studied on whey protein because it's really the, one of the, the probably the most efficient anabolic uh, protein powders. Um, but um, muscle full means that a certain amount of whey protein um, will maximize the growth process and recovery and over that amount of whey protein, it will not. Now, most of the research in muscle full has shown that about 20 grams of whey protein powder, which gives you about half of the whey protein, uh, 20 grams of amino acids, uh, about 20, about 10 grams of that is the, the uh, essential aminos, including in, including branch chain amino acids. So, um, about 20 grams is um, generally what you want to take post workout. Okay. I've seen some of these big giant tubs in the stores that if they fell off the shelf, they would kill you. Um, you know, they weigh 40 pounds or something and they must have a laundry scoop in them. I don't know, but you know, that more is better. And again, so many people get, get the idea that more is well, if a little bit is good of something more must be better. And it's not, it's a matter of timing. Uh, it's a matter of getting the right amount in there, uh, right amount of nutrition in at the right time and, uh, and, and timing it properly. Now, after workout, half an hour to an hour after is probably when you're dipping out of that catabolic level uh, from the workout and going into it trying the body's trying to get back into an anabolic state so that's when it's receptive to uh in amplifying torque uh and uh so about an hour say like you said an hour afterwards or so is fine um and take take in uh say 20 grams of whey protein with a little chocolate milk or some little more protein is not going to be bad it's just that it won't be efficiently used in the anabolic process. It'll be burned as fuel. And so whey protein is an expensive fuel if you just use it that way. So a 20, big guy, big NFL lineman, for instance, yeah, maybe 25 grams, maybe 30 grams of whey protein for that person. But for the average uh, athlete, 20 grams should be enough. And then adding in some torque one into that, that cocktail, a little bit of calories in there, and the chocolate milk, a little sugar, something in there is absolutely fine. Um, the body will utilize that in the anabolic process. Then you can come back later. Um, the body um, is, is receptive again to an anabolic push about three hours later. So after the workout, say an hour after, you can do, do a, a, a load of, uh, like you said, chocolate milk or something, or, or just whey protein, flavored whey protein or whatever, and then with some torque one in there. And you could come back later. You wouldn't you want to come back an hour later or two hours later. You'd probably come back about three hours later when the body's done its duties and it's receptive to additional nutrition at that point to keep the anabolic drive moving, okay? Because you'll turn it off. I mean, you can turn it off too. If you stop getting calories in there, you can turn it off. And there's a fine line between this and getting too many calories, obviously, too, because ultimately you want to build build muscle protein. But if your training's been really intense 
you can come in with another uh, another shot of uh, nutrition about three hours later. And that could be a, also a chicken breast or something, you know, some other type of protein. But every three hours after that, the body would be a receptive. And then you can really milk this anabolic mTOR pathway and this drive pathway very efficiently. So I, I think, you know, uh, the important uh, message is, is because this is absolutely congruent with the training message. If a little is good, 20 times more is not better. Mm -hmm. There's a threshold and a break-even point, a tipping point, if you will. You know, so the best way to describe uh, the training, uh, the best analogy for training is, is also the best, is actually a more appropriate analogy for the nutrition. Uh, in the sense, of, like, if you were to take, you know, a dose of chemotherapy for cancer, you know, uh, you're walking a fine line. You take too much and you're dead. You know, and you take none and you're at risk. You know, you're a huge risk if you're already a cancer patient. There is like an exact window of dosage that makes a lot of sense. And on either side, they're either useless or deadly. And I and training, it can be, it's just like that. And this is also the same thing. It's like, you know, this much protein makes a lot of sense. Below that, now nah, you're not going to get the same effect. Way above that, you might as well just be spitting in the wind. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and with... Even like with like myosync or any other product, we, we, there's a dosage that makes a lot of sense. And then right. you, you going way off of that, that course is not valuable at all. In some cases can be, you know, negative, you know, it's, it's not, it's not doing any additional good. So you have to kind of shake that cultural thing that we have in America, more is always better. Uh, and, 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 and try to, you got to really kind of, you know, use your head and really think about it. What makes the most sense? What is, um, uh, being precise, if you will, the right amount of training with the right amount of protein, with the right amount of uh, whatever supplements you might be taking in conjunction with the, with each other is going to give you the best response and give you what you're looking for. So I think that's the key, you know, message for a lot of people, uh, who might be listening to, to this today. Um, so I'm excited cause we got new, new stuff to, that we're, we're, we're working on. And uh, it's an evolving process. So from the time that you and I first started having these conversations a couple of years ago, you know, new stuff's happened. And so you've, you've come along new information and we even tweaked Myosync uh, after we had first talked about it. By the time we actually got into production, it was a little bit different because you, you had right. come up with a couple of new ideas. And since we start talking about Torque One, like you said, there might be a couple of things that are a little bit different than when we first started having the conversation. That's, so that, to me, that's what's exciting is like, like as you said, this is accelerating the improvement level and the development of the science is accelerating as opposed to just standing pad. It, it's moving fast and, and we're learning more all the time. And the communication ability, obviously, with the so, uh, former Soviet scientists and other scientists around the world has made this possible. So I really appreciate your time, as, as you know, and, and uh, I'm excited because I think what we're what you're doing here is is really what the athlete is after, not the bodybuilder, not necessarily the power lifter. Uh, but the guy who's trying to perform better. And that's really what ultimately matters. You know, when you go on the field, you can look the part, and that's great. But if you can't play the part, <laughs> you're not going to be there very long. <laughs> you know what I mean? you got to yeah, be able to sure. play the part. That's really what matters. They, they don't, like I, I tell everybody, they don't give checks out for different scores or what you look like, how much you weigh, or if you can pass a functional movement screen. They give checks out for people who can play. Yep. And that's all that matters. So I appreciate uh, all the, uh, all your help with this, uh, explaining this stuff. Just, do you have any parting thoughts on it? No, I think it's just a matter of the, the recognize that a supplement is a tool. And uh, it's a tool to be used with the right kind of training and get with the right trying to, kind of training. There's a lot of lousy training, too, that goes on. Okay. A lot of, you know, urban legend, historically, this is how we've done it kind of a thing. And right. training, is, training itself is advanced. Yeah. Uh, and the research and training and the experiences of good coaches has advanced. So the supplements amplify that good the good training uh, response, and that's really where the, where we look at is um, trying to get the nutrients in there in certain windows of opportunity to uh, to ultimately achieve the goal of better reaction, quicker, faster, uh, fine fine motor skills, whatever it is, you know, and fine motor skills, you know. It's, you might think of, well, okay, fine motor skills, what does that mean? But uh, we've even tested this uh, myosync uh, early on with uh, golfers and uh, table tennis players and billiard players. Because if you think about it, those are all extremely fine motor skills, especially putting in golf, uh, that uh, 
um, and, and being able to, from the, from the eye all the way to the brain to the nervous system, central nervous system, and on out to the peripheral, is um, really activating these muscles in a very controlled way, depending on whatever your sport is. If you want to make it fast, then you train fast. You know, if you want to make it explosive, you train explosive, and it will just follow right along with that. So that's what we're going to continue on doing is looking at the different windows of, uh, of athletic opportunity. Um, I don't think we're, you're going to see a, a, a whole plethora of, you know, 10 products out, out of us. I think you're going to see maybe four or five things that I think uh, will really benefit athletes. Some things that maybe athletes are really deficient in, like the, the fish oil that we explained, uh, we talked about, and, uh, and, a, and a few other things. And uh, just get the right nutrients in there at the right time, and you get better results. Yeah, I, it, like I said, you hit the nail on the head. I appreciate uh, that. Like it's, we got to be really good at the training. You got to get good at that. And this, and and, and then you got to get really good with this. You know, this company actually, ironically, is what I wish there would have been around when I was younger and got started. Something that actually hit the nail on the head and gave me what I was looking for, as opposed to uh, you know just uh, the bodybuilding type of response, but like a real a real response for the training of what I was looking for. So uh, I'm hoping that for the younger athletes now, you know, we're able to provide that. And, and you know, you're the by far the most knowledgeable guy uh, around that I know of uh, in the field. And uh, so, you know, they're, they're able to take advantage of uh, our cumulative, what, 55 some years, 60 years of, of experience in the field. And, and, and both of us having dealt with the highest level scientists in the world, not not mm -hmm. just anybody. They were the highest level, me on the training side and you on the ergogenic side, but, you know, the highest level guys. So this information isn't just some, you know, uh, extrapolated research that was done in the United States on mice or whatever the case may be. This is proven stuff that was done on athletes, uh, you know, whether it be in the former Soviet Union or somewhere else. But it come from the top level. So I think that everybody can, you know, uh, be assured that the quality and the expertise that goes into these is of the absolute highest level. So thanks a lot again, Rick, and we'll be talking to you soon.